Test one two one two. Testing yes. Test one two one two one two. Test test one two one two. Test one two. Test one two. Good morning. Grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ. I welcome you here to this place of worship, whether you are here with us live or whether you are live streaming with us. We're really grateful that you're joining us for worship this morning. 
So if you're here live, I want to remind you to register your attendance on the pew pads at the end of your row. So you can take a moment now and see if you can find those pew pads and register your attendance at this very moment. I would not take any offense to that. Or you can do it later on in the service when there is a lull, like sometime during the sermon, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I also want to let you know we're taking a little survey. So um, there, the leadership in the church is considering starting worship half an hour later at 10 a.m. We're considering this. We haven't made a decision. We're just considering it. And so if you have strong feelings either for or against this half-hour change, I want to encourage you to write them on this slip of paper and either write, yes, I really like the idea, or no, I don't, and just kind of give us some feedback about why this might be a problem for you. Um, because we really would like to, to have all of your input. And then when we pass around um, the offering plates, you can just put your little slip of paper in the offering plate, and um, we can take the time then to read those and to consider your input. So um, I just want to bring your attention to this. Also, we have a couple of studies going on. Um, I hope you're taking a look at the announcements that are inside of your bulletin. Um, there's a spirituality book study happening. Um, Joan Chittister is always a wonderful voice to study and to learn more about. And so um, I really encourage you to participate in her study, in the study that's being led through February 16th. Uh, between the dark and the daylight. So um, if, you're, if you haven't been doing any spirituality studies, this would be a great one to do. Like I said, Sister Joan is really a, a great voice out there. Um, and then also, I'm going to be leading an introduction to the Bible study. It is a really accessible study. It's just three weeks. How, what are the strategies for navigating your Bible? When you look at that big, thick book on the shelf, where do you start? And so it will give you some ideas about where you might start, how you might open it, what the first book to read might be. You might not want to start with Genesis because by the time you get to Leviticus, you're going to be worn out. So we really want you uh, to be able to, to make this book accessible and to use it. So that's what that study is about. I want to remind you um, about the annual Martin Luther King breakfast on Monday that is accessible via live stream. Um, so we hope that you will take participate in that or at least do something um, to remember Martin Luther King and the fight for civil rights during this long week. Um, I, that is all, those are all of the announcements that I have for you this morning. Um, so I would like for us to begin our worship. Let our worship begin.
Welcome to Sudbury United Methodist Church on this second Sunday after Epiphany. My name is Christy White, and it is my pleasure to serve as your liturgist this morning. Please stand and join me for the call to worship. We do have a left side and a right side this morning. Uh, right side, just give me a wave. Perfect. You're going to respond first, and then left side will come in. One day. One day. One day, every valley gonna be filled. One day. One day, every mountain and hill gonna be made low. One day. One day. On the crooked gonna be made straight. One day, one day, all the rough ways gonna be made smooth. One day, one day, one day, God's gonna do it. We're all gonna see it. Please remain standing for our opening hymn, which can be found on page 2237 in the faith we sing. As we remain standing, please join us in the opening prayer. God, thank you for inspiring people in all nations and in all cultures. We experience you differently and even call you by different names. Allah, Yahweh, Elohim, Jehovah, Brahma, Unmoved Mover, Redeemer, Love, life, creator, eternal. In our hearts, we know that these are all names for the same God, although differences frighten us. We ask you today that we will follow you and become so committed to you and your kingdom that names will become secondary to the spirit we all feel as one human race. May we establish a kingdom after your own heart, a beloved community where all people will seek understanding and mutual benefit, where all people will live together in peace, 
where all people will seek the spark of the divine in each one, where all people will choose love instead of judgment, curiosity instead of fear, humanity instead of hate, a place where we might truly be the people you created us to be, free to offer our gifts to a world in need, in Jesus' beloved name, amen. Please be seated. This morning's reading comes from Isaiah chapter 49, verses 1 through 7. Listen to me, O coastlands. Pay attention, you people from far away. The Lord called me before I was born. While I was in my mother's womb, he named me. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver, he hid me away. And he said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and vanity. Yet surely my cause is with the Lord and my reward with God. And now the Lord says, for who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him and that Israel might be gathered to him for I am honored in the sight of the Lord and my God has become my strength. He says, it is, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the survivors of Israel. I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One, to one deeply despised, abhorred by the nations, the slave of rulers, Kings shall see and stand up, princes, and they shall prostrate themselves because of the Lord, who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, who has chosen you. May God bless the reading and the hearing of these words. Thanks be to God. At this time, may I please have the children. Good morning. Good morning. I brought a thing today. This thing is in a bag, but I'm not going to show you what it is yet. First, I'm going to describe the thing to you. Still there. And then you're going to guess what the thing might be. Okay? So first of all, it fits in this bag. Second, it's blue, mostly. It's soft and fuzzy all over. And it's, it's kind of fluffy on top. It's not fluffy all over, but it's fl fluffy on the top. But there's, there's, it, it has a covering on the top of it that's black and is hard, and it's got spiky points on the top. The spike, the, the black hard covering is for like protection and secrecy. Now, I'll give you more hints. I can wear this on my hand, and when I do, it makes me think of incredible stories that I heard when I was young, mm -hmm. and stories that have been told for generations. Oh, you already have a guess? Uh, is it gloves? It's not gloves. It's not gloves. Now, if I were to remove the black covering from the top, those stories that remind me of, 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 of uh, the, the incredible stories, they, they wouldn't come to mind anymore. But suddenly this thing would be more expressive and let me tell new stories. All right, one more hint. I can use this thing anytime, but it works best if I'm hiding behind a wall. Any guesses? It's blue. It's soft and fuzzy. It's got a hard covering on top that's black. I use it behind a wall. Yes, Alex. 
It's not a flashlight. Would you like to see what it is? All right. It is a puppet wearing a Batman mask. (laughs) Yep. Everything that I said about this is true. And, 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 and yeah, there it is. But, but, but and, and you can, you, you can see that. Oh man, it's showing his mouth. Hang on. There we go. Puppet wearing a Batman mask. Now, you weren't going to know that it was a puppet wearing a Batman mask. Even though everything that I described about that was it. But, 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 but once you saw it, all the other things made sense. It's blue. It's fuzzy all over. It's fluffy on top, but it's got a hard black covering with pointy things on top. It makes me think of stories that I learned about when I was young, Batman, and that have been told for generations, Batman. And if you take, if you take it off, suddenly, I don't think of Batman anymore but now I can use it to tell other stories, and it works best if I'm hiding behind a wall. Yeah, yeah. But it's hard to know what, it it was really hard to figure out that it would have been that. And we've been looking at prophecies in Isaiah for weeks, and I keep on telling you that these things pointed to Jesus. And there's one today that, that has a lot of things in it that, 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 that point to Jesus, a servant in whom God will be glorified, who, whose cause is with God. Uh, and, and it says that God formed him in the womb to bring Israel back to God, that royalty will worship this servant, right? And we didn't really know exactly who that was going to be or any of the other prophecies. But then once Jesus came and fulfilled all of them, we could see the whole picture, and we could see that, the, that Jesus is our Messiah and Savior. So that's why all these prophecies that we've been reading, one of, one of the reasons that all these prophecies we've been reading are so important. Cool? Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for the prophecies that told us about Jesus, and thank you for revealing the Messiah who fulfills all of the things that you promised. Help us to live so that Jesus' life and light is our guide in this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Take off. Oh, yes, my 
Would you please stand for a reading of the gospel? Our reading can be found on page 92 in the New Testament and comes from John chapter 1, verses 29 through 42. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and he declared, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water, water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. The next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples, and as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, what are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated, translated means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come and see. They came and saw where he was staying and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which translated is anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas, which translated means Peter. May God bless the hearing and the reading of this word. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God, and thank you, Christy, for that reading of the scriptures. Will you all please take a moment to join me for a word of prayer? Let's pray together. God of the beloved community, we are a people who are already and not yet. As a society, we have come so far since the light of people like Martin Luther King and Ella Baker walked among us. 
yet we still have so much more work to do. Show us ways to love, not just to tolerate each other. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts delight to you, dear God. Amen. So this past Thursday, as I was driving to Rolling Ridge, I was listening to a radio program. Um, Rolling Ridge is the United Methodist Retreat Center in North Andover, and I was on my way to teach a class, the latest group of new pastors in our annual conference. I was on my way to teach them about sexual misconduct, which is a real concern in churches of all denominations today. What I teach them is how to recognize it, how to avoid it, and what happens if we don't. On my way up there, I was listening, as I said, to this radio program, and Andrea Cabral, the former Suffolk County Sheriff and Massachusetts Secretary of Public Safety, she was being interviewed on the radio as I was driving through snowy gusts along 495. She was talking about the disappearance of a Cohasset woman, Anna Walsh, who I think you've all heard about. It's almost impossible not to have heard about this news story over the last few weeks. This crime has been getting a lot of media attention, and I was struck by the former sheriff's words. When a young woman or a person of color disappears, particularly if they are black, suspicion that they have run away from home, are running away from something, or have done something is a great emphasis in the media. She went on to say, we take the lives of people of color far less seriously by devaluing them, by not believing them. Now I want to take a moment to just flash back and go back in time to 1964, almost six decades ago. During that time, three civil rights activists traveled to Neshoba County in Mississippi to investigate the burning of the Mount Zion Methodist Church. Two of them were white and from New York City. The third one was a black resident of Neshoba County. The three men all disappeared and were found seven weeks later, buried in a dam site in Neshoba County. If this, if this story doesn't rattle your bones, cool your blood, there's more. In the process of dragging the river over those seven weeks, they found the bodies of eight additional black men, five of whom still have not been identified to this day, and none of whom they were looking for. None of whom they were looking for. The horror of this story was the impulse for an outspoken woman whose name was Ella Baker to stand before the National Democratic Convention in Atlantic City, New Jersey, a place where she was not welcome because of the color of her skin, and speak these words, and I quote, remember, this was six decades ago, before many of you were even born, while some of us were still little, this is what she said. Until the killing of black mothers' sons becomes as important to the rest of the, of the country as the killing of white mothers' sons, we who believe in freedom cannot rest. This morning, Isaiah said this. 
God made my mouth like a sharp sword. Clearly, he might have been thinking of Ella. On this Martin Luther King Sunday, we acknowledge, with great thanks, the contributions of King and all those who supported him as he worked to bring justice and hope into a country, into our country, and to help us to confront our racist behaviors. On Friday, we remembered King in Boston with the unveiling of the embrace. Anybody go to that by any chance? Nobody? Yeah. I, I did not either, but they unveiled the embrace. It's a beautiful statue, and it commemorates the embrace of Martin and Coretta King after Martin learned that he would be receiving the Nobel Peace Prize. This beautiful reminder of our struggles with civil rights sits in the Boston Common. The Boston Common was founded in 1634. It is America's oldest park. The Common was established just 15 years after the first slaves were brought to this country in 1619. While we have so much to atone for, so much to seek reparations for, there is also so much for us to celebrate in how far we have come. And frankly, so much historical irony that became reality in my mind at the moment of that unveiling. Now, we will have plenty of opportunities to celebrate the light that Dr. Martin Luther King shed on our country in the days ahead. And I hope you might even take a field trip to the common to go visit this wonderful statue or join in one of the many breakfasts organized in King's name in the coming week. There's so much to hold up, so much to aspire to in the legacy of Martin Luther King. However, this morning, I would like to speak to you about a different light a light that was shed by a woman who joined King in his struggle, struggle, a woman named Ella Baker. Now, Ella Baker was born in 1903 in Norfolk, Virginia, and grew up with grandparents who had been slaves. They shared their memories of the atrocities of slavery with her. She heard about how her grandmother Betsy Ross, refused to be bred like a cow or an animal for the purpose of producing lighter-skinned children. Betsy was brutally whipped and banished from the house to toil in the fields. And as the story goes, Betsy plowed all day and danced all night to demonstrate her unbroken spirit to those who held her in bondage. After emancipation, Ella's grandfather, Mitchell Ross, became a pastor, and he also became a farmer, and he guaranteed that his children and their children would never again suffer the hunger and the starvation that he and Betsy experienced during their slavery. As I'm sure you know, hunger was one of the ways that masters kept their slaves in line. It was one of the ways they kept them from escaping, by keeping them underfed. As a matter of fact, that captivity gave him a vis visceral aversion to certain foods, like cornbread, which he couldn't stomach, and he refused to force his children to eat cornbread. Now, Ella's mother, Anna, she was a missionary in her community, and she served her neighbors in need, 
taking some of the food from the farm that her father had and giving milk and vegetables and fruit to from the family garden to her community members who were sick. And she also gave special attention to women who were giving birth. This amazing and spirited family gave Ella her understanding of the importance of freedom and dignity and community. She understood her baptism, not only as a personal change, a turning from sin, but also as her own personal commissioning to eradicate sin from society. She didn't enter the ministry. She didn't pursue a call to be a missionary. Instead, Ella Baker pursued social justice. And from her youth, Ella had a theological awareness that led her to respect the image of God in all people, lifting up the lowly and caring for the least of these. Equipped with a college education, by the way, she was the valedictorian of her high school and her college class, experienced as a journalist with 15 years working for the NAACP, Baker eventually found her way to work with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, even working for two and a half years as their interim director Although she probably knew she would never become their director, not because of the color of her skin, but because of her gender. The intersection of both racism and sexism continually created obstacles to her leadership opportunities in the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which was made up primarily of pastors. She felt that the organization was sluggish, it wasn't moving forward fast enough, and she was even critical of Martin Luther King for keeping too much distance between himself and the people. Ella valued people, particularly young people, and listening to them. And in 1960, she persuaded the Southern Christian Leadership Conference to invite university students into their gatherings. And at this meeting, a group called SNCC was formed, an organization that represented the interests of students in the movement. The student-led lunch counter sit-ins replicated so well, if you have ever been to Atlanta and visited the Civil Rights Museum, were part of the goals of that group. They resulted in hundreds of arrests. Baker became a mentor in SNCC, supporting the young people in finding their own voices, their own relationships, their own agenda, their own understanding of what justice is. She was instrumental in influencing a lot of young leaders, people like Julian Bond and Diane Nash and Bernice Johnson Reagan. Johnson Reagan will be the composer of a song you'll hear a little later during the offertory. Some of her contemporaries claim that Baker, not King, was the most powerful person in the struggle for justice. The struggle for justice. Justice for people of color, justice for women, justice for young people, justice for the poor. They can only continue when people like Ella Baker and Martin Luther King and Andrea Cabal and you and I answer the call you heard this morning by the great prophet Isaiah. God made my mouth like a sharp sword in the shadow of his hand. He hid me. God made me a polished arrow in his quiver. He hid me away. 
In this beautiful song by Isaiah, we are the servants, the hands and the feet of God. We speak the truth to power. Despite all of our confusion, our questions, our misinterpretations, our failures, hope still sits in our hearts. We want to do the right thing. Light still dwells in our souls. Even though the servant in this text has worked without results, he even admits that, used God's gifts for vanity, the servant still remembers God's call, God's high purposes, that we, all of us, all of us, might be a light to the nations. May the light of Martin Luther King inspire you this morning. May the light of Ella lead us. May we, the people who have attained so much in our lifetime, continue to climb the steep mountain of justice. May we never be satisfied by the accomplishments of the past, but always, remain vigilant. A holy one has chosen us. Amen. I invite you now to stand in body or spirit as we sing hymn number 474, Precious Lord, Take My Hand. I want to remind you that this was the hymn that Martin Luther King requested be sung at his funeral as he lay dying in Memphis, Tennessee. Praise God. Please be seated. Aww. So we have 
we have one celebration. I'm going to start with the celebrations this morning. We have a celebration. Today is my dad, John Condon's birthday. No, my dad. <laughs> He'd be pretty old if he was my dad. That came from Ellie. We were so grateful. Thank you so much, Ellie. Happy birthday, John. Um, we have um, prayers this morning for people who are living with mental illness and the people who are the caretakers for them. May we continue to be in prayer for people who struggle with mental illness. Um, Denise Shea suffered a catastrophic failure of a recent hip replacement, and she had emergency surgery. She's now in rehab. So we are going to pray for her progress, for her husband, Richard, her daughter, Adelaide, and that comes from Ernie and Sherry Stonebreaker. And finally, the flowers on the altar are dedicated, dedicated to Lynn McLean as she heals from a back injury. I want to ask you right now if you'll take a moment to just breathe. Breathing is a way that we nourish our bodies, much like sleeping and eating. <sighs> Breathing is a lot harder now because we know about COVID and we worry about that. And yet breathing is absolutely necessary for our longevity and our well-being. So I want to ask each of you to take a big, deep breath in and hold that breath. And now exhale. Do it again. Another big, deep breath. We'll count to three. Three. Exhale. And feel your body just settling into the pew. Speak, Lord. For your children are listening. We need a word of encouragement, a word of instruction about how we ought to live in these troubled days, in these troubled lands. Speak, Lord, for your children are listening. As we drift off to sleep in down-covered beds, in marble palaces, or in sawdust, padded pallets on dusty floors. We're listening, God. Rich or poor, we're listening, young and old, for a word from you that will heal ourselves and our lands. This morning we pray for Lynn McLean as she heals, and for Denise Shea, as she also heals. And we ask God for all of those who suffer, suffer with mental illness, anxiety, depression, all of the various forms and ways our minds and our bodies struggle to be whole. We ask for those. Eternal God, you are the lover of our souls and we come to you hungering for something from you that will change the rest of our lives. We hunger for honesty instead of corruption, for generosity instead of greed. We hunger for integrity instead of intrigue. We hunger for our neighbors to be fed and for all to have enough honest work to provide for their basic needs and those of their families. We come this morning hungering for righteousness to flow like rainwater and for justice, like an ever-flowing stream. 
We come hungering and we come listening for your words to us, describing how we can participate in your great work of creation and recreation. We come listening for ways that can become a part of the solution and not a part of the problem. We come listening in fear and trembling, praying that we will have the courage to respond and to act if we hear a clear word of instruction from you. We give thanks this morning for the life of John Condon, for his birth, for his family, for his choices in life. May he inspire us as we hope to share God's word in the world. And yet, Lord, we continue to listen. Speak, God. For your children are listening and praying. We pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now in a complete shift of the sense of time, I'm going to introduce myself as the stewardship speaker. Here I go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here to talk to you this morning about mission shares. Now, I know some of you have no idea what mission shares are, and probably um, it's ooh, like not something that is of great concern to you. But it's of great concern to me and to some other people, and certainly the leaders in the church, because I keep talking to them about mission shares and how it's important for us to pay mission shares. And I am really grateful to all of you for your generosity because this year we paid not 50%, not 60%, not 70%. We paid 100% of our mission shares. So I want everyone to say hooray. Now, why is she so excited about this? Well, mission shares are something that it is assessed to us each and every year. We're asked to pay a certain amount of money to the annual conference to pay our portion of certain missions in the world. Okay, now there are three different types. There are New England missions, right? Um, the, what it costs us to support campus ministries and our church camps, our faith communities, some regional um, churches that and urban ministries to supplement them. We work towards diversity and inclusion ministries using our mission shares, congregational development. Um, we have six state councils of churches that we support in New England because there are six, six states in New England. We support the Board of Laity. We support our clergy. Um, we support all of the infrastructure of our annual conference. We even support our district superintendent, Wee Chang, and the costs of having a bishop, we do all of that. That is one of the things that our mission shares do. 
Another thing that they do is they provide benefits for retired clergy. That's called ministry support. That's the second fund. And they provide salaries and housing and offices um, for the district superintendents and their ministries. Um, they provide support for our administrative board, our agencies, our staff, all of those things. And then, to me, what is probably one of the most important things that our mission shares support are world missions. So, we pay a general church apportionment that supports ministries throughout the world, including a world service fund that supports ministries and programs in this country and around the world. Um, our Black College Fund supports eight historically black colleges throughout the United States. Africa University um, provides support to United Methodist uh, clergy in um, Zimbabwe. Our Episcopal Fund supports Episcopal offices throughout the connection. Our Ministerial Education Fund supports clergy education, but it even goes farther than that. If you have a kid who's going to college and is a member of the church, call me. There's a scholarship there. It might not be much, but it's every little bit helps, as you well know. Um, and it also um, supports just some general administrative work for all of the world missions that we do. Our mission shares are really important. We are just one of 350,000 United Methodist churches in the United States. Every one of them pays mission shares. And so when we can pay 100% of our mission shares, it's a great thing. So I thank you. I hope I haven't bored you. Thank you for letting me do this mission moment. If you have any questions about what a mission share is, you know where to come. God bless. Okay, back to my other role. And now I'm going to ask if the ushers will come forward.
Gracious Liberator God, we have been blessed with great abundance. In offering these gifts, may we be strengthened to make our mouths like sharp swords and speak truth to power, like Martin, like Ella, like the young people. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. And now, friends, I invite you to remain standing as we sing the hymn, Lift Every Voice and Sing. <laughs>
thing I want to add, add a little disclaimer. If you did not like the offertory hymn, it was my suggestion. So do not talk to Kevin or Rob about it. It was me. I did it. Um, I want to thank you all for being here today. I want to bless you as you go out into the world as people who are already have already come so far as that beautiful statue in the Boston Common reminds us we've come so far and yet remind you that we have so much further to go. May you be a peaceful of peace and love and deep care as we travel that journey together. Go in peace, my friends. Amen. Mm -hmm.